Well, we are going to hear from uh, our new CSCA Vice President, Heather Pryor. And uh, it's, it's a delight to introduce Heather to all of you. Uh, Heather teaches and studies biology and its history. And she works as an associate professor at the King's University in Edmonton. And uh, she has a PhD in ocular genetics from the University of Alberta. She was introduced to the CSCA and ASA by King's colleagues and has enjoyed attending uh, various, faith, uh, various faith and science conferences, as well as serving at the Edmonton chapter as its leader, its chapter leader, for three years before joining the CSCA executive uh, a year ago now. So uh, it's my great delight to introduce Heather. We're so glad that you are serving on the exec and uh, that you are here to address us today. Her talk is entitled, All Generations, A Personal Story of Inheritance. And can I pray for you, Heather, before you get started? Father, we just thank you so much for this time together. Uh, we thank you that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, working in a variety of fields who seek to uh, do our work with integrity, uh, to serve and love you with our hearts, minds, soul, and strength and to serve our neighbor and love our neighbor as ourselves. And we thank, thank you that we can do that um, by pursuing science and by being on this journey together. Lord, we lift Heather to you. Uh, we pray that you would be with her as she presents and uh, that we would all uh, hear from you in the midst of what she says. We pray in Christ's name, amen. amen. Take it away, Heather. Thank you very much. Patrick, for those warm words. And I would like to say that it's really my privilege and delight to be able to be involved here with the CSCA. Actually, this is my first annual general meeting. And here I am speaking at it um, as vice president. So how do you like that? These things happen. Um, what I'd like to do with you tonight is to kind of do three things. Maybe that's too many, but you know, three main points. Um, I'd like to give you a glimpse into my own personal story, and so um, you kind of have a sense of where I've come from and, and the journey that I'm on. I would like to um, also give you a glimpse into one of my research projects, which I'm quite excited and passionate about, partly because it, it probably, it certainly connects most directly to my personal story. And then finally, I'd like to encourage you by sharing throughout uh, at a few key points in my talk, uh, sharing from scripture, which is one of my deepest loves and, and, and sources of strength. And thank you, Patrick, for sharing Psalm 46 with us already tonight. And uh, so um, thank you for, for uh, taking the time to listen to me and um, it's great to be able to join together. So here is my talk. All Generations, A Personal Story of Inheritance. There we go. So it happened that I was born in a college town in California, not Canada. I hope that's all right. More than 50 years ago, but my story neither started there, nor will it really end there, I, I don't imagine. But tonight I invite you to journey with me along the twisted helix of my rich biological and spiritual inheritance, one that has led me to encounter and embrace the CSCA and to consider what inheritance we should pass to future generations. As a biologist working in the area of molecular and developmental biology, I'd say we are now living in a golden age of genetics, genomes, and genealogies. The 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded just this past month to two women, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, for their work on the CRISPR technique of gene editing. This powerful tool to alter almost any genome with relative ease is derived from a type of bacterial molecular defense against invading viral DNA. You see it depicted on the slide here. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go through it like I might with my students uh, with you tonight. 
But this discovery has reignited enthusiasm for, but also debates over gene therapy, particularly the prospect of germline alteration in humans. Since the completion of the Human Genome Project, many companies have seen both the therapeutic and commercial potential in offering services for DNA sequencing, whether for finding long lost cousins such as Ancestry.com or possible alleles for genetic susceptibility to disease such as at 23andMe, having a DNA profile on file is rapidly becoming the norm, especially in our North American high-tech society. I have also discovered a specific Mennonite genealogical database called Gramma. Maybe it sounds a little old fashioned. Gramma is genealogical registry and database of Mennonite ancestry. And it's based on good old fashioned family trees. And sure enough, I discovered myself and my Mennonite ancestors there too, going back quite a few generations. Just this past week, companies such as Pfizer and Moderna have announced exciting results for developing vaccines to prevent COVID. As we know, the most promising ones based on a cutting edge method of injecting mRNA rather than inactivated virus in order to develop immunity. The injected mRNA encodes signature spike protein from the SARS-CoV-2 virus and so the body's own cells can produce targets for antibodies. But we are all too aware that in spite of the promise of genetic technologies like CRISPR, genome sequencing, mRNA vaccines, we still experience many human frailties. In this week of Remembrance Day, I'm personally marking the second anniversary of my father's death and grieving the passing of two dear aunties and an uncle, all the three siblings of my mother within the last two months. Many have lost loved ones due to COVID and more losses are on the horizon. A personal journey with grief of a little different kind of loss began for me and for my husband, Dean, over 25 years ago when we struggled intensely with infertility for three years before the birth of our son, Daniel. Thinking that his birth signaled the end of that struggle, we were not well prepared for an additional six years of infertility before we chose to complete our family unit through the adoption of our daughter from China. This is uh, an excerpt that our King's School newspaper did uh, when they interviewed me about the happy news. Conversations about the pain and isolation of the infertility experience led me to embark on a long-standing qualitative research collaboration with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Heather Loy, a psychologist at King's who has also experienced this frailty in her life. And tonight I'd like to just give you a short glimpse into this ongoing project, sharing a few highlights to give you a sense of where it's taken us over the past few years. So we are particularly interested in Christian couples who have experienced infertility. And we see that as a very complex experience, tied, uh, impossible to separate from almost every aspect of life. There's broader social contexts, and we are focusing in particularly on the faith context of infertility that couples experience and what role that plays. So as we zoom in, there are various levels. So we've asked, what roles do personal faith and faith community specifically play as Christian couples make decisions about using assisted reproductive technology? So we've done quite a bit of research work. And what we have discovered in our survey is that sure enough, there are many church scholarly and public policy publications 
that discuss infertility, that discuss bioethics, that put forward um, positions and arguments related to specific techniques, for example, in vitro fertilization. These kinds of documents are really very plentiful. On the other hand, there are also a lot of sources that give emotional support to couples. There are support groups, particularly now, there are a lot of online support groups which allow people to reach out beyond their geographical communities. Um, there's information sharing in this way. Back in the day when I was going through um, the intensity of infertility, we went to in-person support groups, but, but I think it's probably fair to say that now uh, very many of them are done online. However, the experience that my husband and I had was that we felt somewhat lost in our own personal struggle in knowing how to put together our faith, which was central in our lives. And this, this issue that was medical and more than medical, it's social, spiritual, and so on. And, and we experienced that there was a kind of a gap. Oh, here's a little uh, reference for a lot of good summaries of some public documents that are available. So we experienced that there was a gap between this kind of emotional and supportive literature, the scholarly bioethical literature, but as individual Christians, we, we didn't feel a strong sense of guidance. And we really personally felt no guidance at all in our home congregation. In fact, one of the things we did feeling at a loss is we identified a couple in our congregation who had only adopted children and we, we went out on a limb and, and wondered whether they might've experienced infertility. But unfortunately it was a very sensitive topic for them and and they weren't interested in talking with us. And then we felt even worse and more alone than ever. Although um, statistics show that probably one in five couples will experience infertility during the course of their relationship. So in the study that Heather Loy and I came up with, we decided to use a qualitative design in order to invite participants who have experienced infertility to um, tell us about their journey so that we could identify ultimately how we would be able to equip the church to respond better to couples going through this situation. So although my personal training is quantitative, traditional biology, not qualitative, it's been a learning journey for me to embark on a qualitative study, which involves questionnaires as well as in-depth personal interviews. Um, once that huge amount of data is collected, transcripts, for example, very detailed, um, we've embarked on a thematic type of analysis in order to uh, pick out the themes that are emerging from this work. Now, tonight, I am not going to tell you in depth about these results, which are still um, in the process of being collected but I'll just give you a taste of some of the themes that we picked out consistently in the analyses that we did with the transcripts from the individuals that we interviewed. So here are a list of five themes that we recognized, emotional reactions, relationships playing a big role, personal faith in decision-making, the faith community in decision-making, and the awareness and hopes about church positions. I'm just going to look at just a few samples of responses in these last two themes, the faith community and the awareness and hopes about the church position. So almost universally participants did not share infertility broadly with their faith community. And when you see the words in italics here, these are direct words that our participants shared with us. So here it's been a very personal, faith journey, not a community one, just because we don't want to open ourselves up to the public, the public opinion. Additionally, participants saw their situations as highly individualized. They definitely did not want generalizations. Summed up very nicely in this short quotation, every case is different. And in this second dialogue, 
where the interviewer asked your church or faith community hasn't really played a direct or specific role in the journey and the participant said, no, not in a community sense. It's been a very personal faith journey, emphasizing again, not a community one. Finally, with respect to the faith community, there were occasional experiences of pain and misunderstanding coming from members of the faith community. For one couple, they were disappointed with an elder who said they ought to have children. They should have children. Um, and sometimes they experienced lectures or a big spiel from someone else about what Christians should or shouldn't do. And that was experienced as very difficult. When we looked at the way that uh, participants look to their churches in terms of giving them specific resources, it turned out that so far, and we still are recruiting more participants, but so far, absolutely no participants that we have interviewed were aware of any official church positions about infertility. Um, to be fair, most of them also said they didn't look. However, they did not want the church to provide prohibitions, okay? Particularly prohibitions. They, they weren't so specific about um, positive guidelines, but prohibitions were definitely not um, deemed to be appropriate. I'll let you read that one. So I don't think you'll find it surprising to hear that our participants universally wanted the church to listen without judging. Okay? Mostly just listen. In addition to listening, they would be happy to have specific information, connection, and support. So for example, that someone in the church would be able to say to them, we know you're struggling with this. These resources are available. The church has already fought through some of this. If you're interested, there are resources available for you to read and people to talk to if you're not fine. And I think it should be a choice ultimately as a couple. So in summary, when we looked at the experience these participants had, they affirmed what um, Heather and I had experienced very much ourselves as well, that infertility is a private, emotional, and very painful journey that Christians share with family and friends, but less with their faith community or their pastor. They make decisions based on personal values, influenced by faith, but faith individually understood. And they are unaware of church positions about assisted reproductive technology. They believe the church should provide information and support, but not judgment or prescription. One of the ways that we pushed our study further was to then ask ourselves, if this is the experience of congregants, on the flip side, what has the experience been among pastors or the clergy? And um, I'm very happy that we were able to have a research student to help us um, conduct another set of interviews, this time with uh, various pastors from um, at least five different denominations. And she conducted phone interviews in a kind of a mini interview format and explored what their particular church perspective was and also what particular resources their denomination had to offer. Once those interviews were done, once again, there was um, an inductive analysis done in order to pull out key themes that were consistent across the different interviews. Now, there were a number of themes, again, which we identified, but tonight I'll just highlight uh, the center two for you, the prayer, the support, and listening themes. So universally, all the clergy emphasized prayer. So here are a few quotations. Couples have asked me for prayer, more so than advice. And I would offer prayers and support, has prayed for infertile couples in the past. Not too different. Pastors always 
assumed a supportive and listening role. So comments from pastors now here. No judgment, feel safe, not in a harmful way, listen, emphasized. The less talking I do, the better. This is the pastor speaking. And empower people to make the best decisions they can make. Walk alongside people to make their own decisions and trust that God is guiding them. How can I help and empower them? So in summary, um, overall, the clergy felt ill-equipped in particular with with a couple of exceptions to deal with the issue and they didn't report a lot of experience as in they hadn't been contacted frequently by couples experiencing infertility. And they also didn't know about many Christian infertility resources. So we're left with this, this gap situation where there are church and scholarly publications on the one hand, there are support groups on the other hand, but what can we do to help couples navigate, particularly couples of faith? So as we look ahead to try to um, move into a phase of being more, more uh, constructive as a result of this study, um, we've also looked into what web-based resources are already there for Christians who face infertility. And we are hoping to explore some options that we will be able to um, deal with in additional interviews as we now have a very good beginning point to go from. Our research student also did a website survey for us and she found 46 fertility clinic websites, by far the biggest kind of single group of websites that most young couples now facing infertility would be quick to turn to the web. Quite a few support resources, mostly emotional and personal kind of sharing resources. Some news articles, uh, a surprising number of alternative treatments as in the um, non-traditional, non-Western medicine treatments like acupuncture or herbal treatments or other, other non-traditional treatments and some Christian resources. So we have embarked on the beginning of our own website development using a free web, uh, a, a web development server called uh, WordPress, which we hope will get at particularly Christian couples who face um, no one place where they can turn to find the kind of resources that they need. It's still in its infancy, and um, we are doing it one step at a time, but we have, we have begun bridging a gap. This is a subway station gap, mind the gap, um, and hope that we'll be able to help couples connect to quite a few resources starting uh, with this way. And I would like to just acknowledge my collaborator, Heather Loy, in this project, as well as our research student who did the clergy interviews and the website analysis, Christiana Sis. We had support from our colleague in research, Laura Rogers. And uh, of course, I would like to definitely thank the interview participants. I don't, I saw there was a chat there, but I'm not sure if it was for me and if I need to check them. So I think I'll, I'll come back to those at the end. At this point, what I wanted to do was I wanted to share with you a beautiful passage of scripture, a passage from Romans 8 that poignantly captures the parent-child relationship that we experience with God, placing us directly in line for a rich spiritual inheritance. It also happens to recognize the pain and suffering that we experience in life, using none other than the image of sterility and barrenness. So it, um, I've used the message translation here, and these are two excerpts from Romans chapter 8. This resurrection life you received from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we're going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through 
if we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. All around us, we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs. But it's not only around us, it's within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We're also feeling the birth pangs. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. That is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We're enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us, but the longer we wait, the larger we become and the more joyful our expectancy. The Faith and Fertility Project grew out of my personal, biological, and spiritual identity. I could say the Christian faith and the science of biology function together as two integrated strands in the DNA of my personal identity. Although popular culture often casts these two strands of faith and science as antagonistic, for me, they have not felt this way. The CSCA as an organization has been a gap bridger in this area. And as the spiritual and physical body are integrated in each person, I also perceive the spiritual and natural worlds as complementary dimensions of God domain, God's domain. In contemplating the relationship of faith and science as part of my own identity, I've come to a deeper appreciation of the inheritance I've received in both of these strands. Each new strand of a DNA molecule, as I'm sure you know, is directly shaped by the template of a parental DNA molecule. And in a similar way, I recognize that each strand of my identity has been shaped by key sources. My faith has been richly nurtured in the Anabaptist Mennonite tradition, fostering my values of worship and service in community, biblical study, peacemaking, and following Christ in a life of personal discipleship. My first degree in religious studies came from the Mennonite Brethren Bible College in Winnipeg, where it also happened that my father was the chair of the board while I was there, once again entangling the spiritual and biological connections. My passion for science is a legacy passed on to me through a unique personal history. It's been nurtured by many mentors, starting with my parents' early encouragement of my curious nature. Um, this happens to be an anatomy lesson that uh, we had while we were camping because it just so happened that a ground squirrel met an untimely end by um, uh, not through any fault of our own, but we came upon it and uh, its body was perfectly intact. So it was a beautiful opportunity for an anatomy lesson with our kids. My birth happened, which I referred to earlier, while my dad was a PhD student at Stanford University. At that time, they described me as having the fixtures of her mother and the features of her father. I certainly have the outward features of my father, including brown eyes and a career in academia, but I also have many inward features of my mother, such as a sensitive and compassionate heart. One mentor in particular, Dr. Margaret Ann Armour, made the biggest impact on my life as a Christian woman in science. Hoping to cultivate my passion for science, even while I was still a Bible college student, I began working in Dr. Armour's organic chemistry lab at the University of Alberta in my summer breaks. This is a very old picture from that time and one of the spider mazes that we constructed with glassware, which wasn't exactly the goal of our summer research. Dr. Armour fostered curiosity, community and diversity. And for over 30 years, she regularly invited me to her home every single summer, every single Christmas, first just me, then me and Dean, later me, Dean and the kids, and finally even our dog, Thea. She taught me not to be afraid of science, but to learn as much as possible and to surround myself with wise advisors and colleagues. Dr. Armour has been extensively celebrated for her amazing contributions in mentoring women in science. Sadly, she also passed away a year and a half ago 
on the eve of receiving yet another recognition, an honorary doctorate from the Uni Concordia University here in Edmonton. I encourage you to learn more about her. Uh, for example, there's a recent film called Shining Armor. I referenced it here at the bottom of this slide, uh, which is not too long, but it's, it's a lovely tribute to her life, the Margaret Ann Armour stories. Now, I also have very dear mentors at King's, some of who are here on the call tonight. They have played a critical role in shaping my inherited understanding of the dynamic interplay of faith and science. My fellow biologists here, you see them in particular, Harry Cook, King's founding biologist, Hank Bestman, and also John Wood, He's now our ASA uh, president, as we know. Um, these colleagues invited me to the ASA and to the CSA, and I've remained very wise partners for conversation and for consultation. Attending the conferences that the ASA and CSA has put on has also given me a great opportunity to consider biology from a Christian perspective. At several meetings of the ASA, um, perhaps the most decorated participant has been Francis Collins, whom, whose name you will all recognize, director of the NIH currently, former leader of the Human Genome Project, and it has strengthened my faith immensely to know that he is a devout Christian. He's written about his journey of faith as a scientist in his book, which you, you I hope, have also had a chance to see, The Language of God, and he's been such a strong encouragement to me to see the potential for service to humanity as a fruit of understanding basic genetic science. He also recently received the Templeton Prize for Religion and Science. And at that time, his acceptance speech was an incredible plea for compassion and for understanding across the lines that divide us from one another. I think he also shared Psalm uh, 46 at that time, which you read earlier, Patrick. Thus in both aspects of faith and science, I very much see myself as standing in a continuing line of rich inheritance, one which I hope to be able to pass on to future generations. Here are some students, to students and to others around me as well. I feel strengthened by the cloud of witnesses who've run before me and alongside of me. The CSCA is one avenue through which this inheritance of both faith and science can be passed forward. I would like to conclude um, and to tradition, transition us into our time of meeting and reasoning together with scripture. Uh, first, a psalm, and finally, Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. So this is Psalm 8, and yes, that is my father in California putting morsels into my mouth. Listen, dear friends, to God's truth. Bend your ears to what I tell you. I'm chewing on the morsel of a proverb. I'll let you in on the sweet old truths, stories we heard from our fathers, counsel we learned at our mother's knee. We're not keeping this to ourselves. We're passing it along to the next generation, God's fame and fortune, the marvelous things he has done. He planted a witness in Jacob, set his word firmly in Israel, then commanded our parents to teach it to their children so the next generation would know and all the generations to come know the truth and tell the stories so their children can trust in God, never forget the works of God, but keep his commands to the letter. And let me end by sharing uh, Ephesians 3, which is Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. Let it be our prayer for one another. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus 
throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Heather, uh, for that talk. It was very inspiring and just what a great example of what it is we aim to do as the CSCA, um, you know, with, with the Center for Faith and Fertility, to think of people struggling with questions and not knowing where to go for resources. Uh, what a wonderful thing. So thank you. I think we have a few minutes uh, left for uh, some questions. If any of you would like to put a question to uh, Heather, I would encourage you to do so now. I'd just like to thank Heather for sharing her story. Uh, my wife and I also struggled with uh, infertility back for years. Uh, both our children are adopted. And uh, there's something very unique about uh, having going through that experience. And it was uh, those children, uh, our daughter Sarah, we received when she was five days old, and our son Sean was six days old. Um, long story to both of those, but it was a gift in a way that uh, seemed quite unique. Having your children biologically, to in some ways, say just natural matter, of course, but receiving children through adoption, there are some special dimensions that I think resonate also with our being adopted children of God. So thank you for that uh, study and presentation. Thank you, Don. That, um, I appreciate your sharing that, and, and I completely agree with you. I, as I read scripture now and... and um, Adoption figures prominently, and particularly in the New Testament, that we are adopted as God's children. It, it really has a new depth for me, for sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yes, um, if you know of participants who might be interested in, in uh, being interviewed, who are Christian couples that have experienced infertility, um, please share my email address. We are still uh, currently recruiting a few more participants, so that would be great. Um, maybe I should put my email address in the chat. What is, what is your email? Uh, here it comes. There it is. Yeah, Heather, I just wanted to, um, to thank you for sharing your personal story. Having known you at King's, I didn't know much about your personal story, but... Um, I really agree with what you said, like how to respond to people pastorally who may be struggling with infertility by not showing any judgment, by listening and walking alongside them. I mean, I work in a nursing home, so um, fertility issues there are of a <laughs> quite different. But yeah, no, it really, um, it really helped me to, to, um, to see the plight of a lot of people and, um, yeah, to learn how to walk walk alongside them and provide them with resources um, was really helpful to me. So thank you very much. Thanks, David. I, I have to say that um, in in our own experience, we we found we met frustration when we tried to find resources through our church, but ultimately um, we did find that the most helpful thing was to be able to connect with other couples who had not through the church but through the other. Uh, fertility clinic resources uh, who had walked that way before. So I think this is one area that our churches could definitely play a much bigger role in, not necessarily trumping the from the pulpit. Um, that message is loud and clear. It is a very personal and private experience, but um, to be able to support people in this way, definitely. Heather, I also want to thank you for your talk. Uh, it was very inspirational and and, and um, sharing your personal journey with us was, uh, was so meaningful uh, to experience. Um, I've had a number of times uh, that I would be wanting to, to get to know um, a new couple that's joined our church and that sort of thing, and I'm just talking with them. And, um, you know, sometimes they're, you know, around our own age, so they're in their 50s, and just getting to know them, I, I would ask, uh, do you have children? And... I think this has happened a number of times that I've asked that question and the response was just, no, we don't. And it was really awkward. And I, I want to know what you think I should say when I hear 
a, a, a response like that. Um, obviously, they they um, must have gone through infertility, but they seem to not also want to talk about it. And maybe it's not the right context or the right place, but um, um, I just found my that that conversation became very awkward at that point, and and we didn't want to you know press. Oh, so you've you know uh, I'm just wondering what you what what your own experience or advice would be about how to how in the process of getting to know someone and you and you find out uh, in this way um, how how should we respond? Yeah, thanks for that comment, Arnold. Um, infertility really isn't necessarily unique in inviting awkward comments, you know, sometimes um, other types of grief, uh, uh, whether it's illness or deaths or that sort of thing can, um, you know, even questions of sing singleness um, or relationships, uh, I think are a little bit fraught with, with that kind of thing. And, and I'm, as we've, been in touch with uh, lots of couples now who have walked this road. I, I would say it's it's almost every couple who has received insensitive comments, and and I think that many comments are not intended to be insensitive. But when people are hurting, um, in some ways, it turns up the volume on the way that uh, comments can be received. So I don't think we have to go around. Um, necessarily stepping on eggshells for fear of, of hurting people because people can be hurt sometimes when it's the last of our intentions. But particularly when it comes to the topic of infertility, which is very personal and private, and you, and you may have a sense that um, this is an issue in a particular situation, uh, I would probably suggest um, maybe backing away from it. And if, if you if it's a church context or something like that, being able to connect confidentially with a pastoral resource that, that would be able to, to maybe approach someone in that way, uh, particularly if it could be done from the point of view of someone who's already walked along a journey like that. I don't have a canned answer that I think would be perfect. Yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks, Heather. Maybe I can uh, share a little, and I, uh, in response to that last one, it's probably better not to ask personal questions. But in terms of uh, in vitro fertilization and so on, I have a relative, and she and her husband were infertile, and uh, they used assisted technology and eventually got a son and later twin boys. So they now have three boys. And then they were left with the problem of what to do with the other fertilized ova. And uh, they ended up uh, um, allowing those that for adoption. And the uh, couple that received that, in fact, are now very good friends with them. And the child born out of that now has three sets of grandparents. Wow, thanks okay. for sharing that, Herman. But I will send her your email address so that she can contact you and perhaps contribute to uh, your project. Thank you so much, that's wonderful. One of, one of the participating couples that we've already uh, interviewed um, were able to adopt embryos through uh, an embryo adoption program, which, which in Canada has been uh, much more difficult than uh, in the US. So that's another interesting, uh, there, there are a lot of, differences in context between the Canadian and the American situations when it comes to some of those things. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Heather, for uh, sharing with us. And uh, normally when we're live, we would applaud you, but I'm not sure how well that'll work here. There's the, there's the yeah, we could all do this, maybe the little golf clap or something. Thank you very <laughs> but much. But thank you so much uh, for, for addressing us. It's been a blessing uh, and an encouragement, I think, to many. So thank you.